Hi, I'm Paige Sully. I'm with Lyle County Search and Rescue, and I'll be uh, helping you with introduction to legal issues and the Oregon statutes uh, that are relevant to search and rescue. And that's statutes, not the statutes. Uh, Nick put this together for me, and we'll get into it. Previously, the Oregon ORS is, stands for Oregon Revised Statutes. That's the state law here in the state of Oregon. And Chapter 401 covers uh, emergency services, the Office of Emergency Management, and so on. Used to include search and rescue activities as well. Uh, that is no longer the case. At this point, uh, Oregon Revised Statute Chapter 404 covers uh, search and rescue and, and sets out the, the rules and uh, legal framework for search and rescue activities. Okay, uh, with regard to your activities as search and rescue members, there's a couple of terms that you're going to want to be aware of. Scope of practice, that basically is uh, the generally accepted activities for a particular um, uh, service that you may be providing or uh, uh, activity that you may be engaged in. That's, uh, the, the, that's the, the, the standard by which you, the typical person engaging in that activity would find to be reasonable. Standard of care is the, the, the uh, level of care that ha you have to meet in providing the service that you are providing. A duty to act, that's, that's very important. Uh, duty of the duty, search and rescue members acting in their capacity as search and rescue members have a duty to act. And what that means is, is that you cannot refuse to engage in uh, search and rescue activities that you are trained and qualified to participate in while you are acting in your capacity as search and rescue members. In other words, you can't get out in the field and not engage in your search and rescue activities um, to the extent that you are trained to conduct those, those activities. Engendered reliance, that's just a fancy term for what the public expects of us. And uh, what they, b based on what they, they may believe or what they may have read about us, not necessarily what we may have told them about what they can expect from us. Negligence is when you engage in an activity and you basically are not following the standard of care. Uh, you undertake a, a rescue activity and you do not meet the approved standard of care in your performance of that activity. Abandonment primarily is it within the scope of medical services that uh, once you begin providing medical services or treatment to an individual, uh, you cannot turn that individual over to the responsibility of some, somebody with lesser medical training than you have or stop the medical treat, treatment. You must continue to do so until you can transfer the care of that individual to uh, uh, another search and rescue member or rescue personnel that has a higher level of, uh, of training than you do with regard to med the medical treatment. And then consent is, uh, is, is well, well known for the most part, well for all, in all circumstances, we cannot forcibly treat individuals that otherwise have the ability to to deny, deny treatment. Um, documentation, I'm a big fan of, as, as a lawyer, I'm a big fan of documenting everything, the, the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, even if you've done something wrong, it's impor important to document that, first of all, because you're not gonna be able to hide that you did something wrong, and we don't want to anyway. We wanna be straightforward with the public, plus, it's better to admit what you can't deny. And if you did it wrong, you, this way you can demonstrate how and where it went wrong 
and there's no speculation about what other, what other things may have gone wrong in a particular search. Uh, confidentiality, uh, we are re required to maintain confidentiality. This is very important, especially uh, over radio communications. Uh, I, most search and rescue agencies have pretty strict limits on field personnel. Uh, speaking with the, the media in particular, uh, I like to transfer responsibility to talking to the media, to the sheriff's office personnel or the, the uh, public information officer. Good Samaritan laws uh, aren't, you'll, you'll hear a lot about Good Samaritan laws. They're not particularly relevant to us simply because uh, we, are, we have a duty to act. Good Samaritan laws are, out, are designed to protect volunteers who are under no duty to engage in volunteer activities. Whereas when we're acting in the scope of search and rescue, we have a duty to act. Uh, we, uh, so we're, we're governed by the duty to act laws. The Volunteer Protection Act of 1997, that's what covers us as uh, search and rescue members with a duty to act. HIPAA, that's the federal law with regard to disclosure of med medical information. Uh, because we are not medical professionals, it is not something that is uh, too directly relevant to us, but you always want to keep in mind that medical information oftentimes is encompassed in your confidentiality requirements. And then crime scenes, uh, if you go into mo re rescues and recoveries with the mindset that this could be a, mine scene, a crime scene that you want to preserve, you don't want to contaminate, uh, then you'll always uh, make sure that the, the scene of the situation is, that its integrity is maintained to the greatest extent possible. Okay. Uh, occasionally in your search and rescue activities, either searching or rescuing, you may in, in, encounter a situation where you have to cross or enter on to what's clearly private property in order to either continue your search or to rescue or recover an individual. Uh, we do not have a blanket pass on uh, tr on trespassing. We, ha like everybody else, have to make every e effort possible to obtain permission to enter onto or cross the private property. Um, if, you, if you're way in the back country, you don't have a clue who owns the private property, there's nobody near my, no house, no, no vehicles, and you have to cross under private pro into private land under accident circumstances, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. Uh, you should make sure and let your incident commander know that you are entering onto the private property. Give them an idea of where it's at, and they can then follow up and attempt to notify the pr private landowner. If a landowner denies you access uh, onto their private property, then uh, you have to abide, abide by that request. If there's an absolute need to enter onto that private property anyway, you should contact command and have them refer it to law, en law enforcement to, to make, those, to make that, that entry. This, is, uh, this can become a big issue if you are in, involved in doing fire evacuation notices as a lot, of, a lot of properties will be fenced, gated, or have no trespassing signs. <clears throat> in which case, you're not there for exigent circumstances. You should just leave the, the notification paperwork uh, in the mailbox or on the, on the fence and not enter onto the, to the private property. We uh, oftentimes will be required to respond to a search or a rescue in a wilderness area where mechanized equipment is otherwise prohibited. Uh, as search and rescue members, we can use mechanized equipment in a wilderness area uh, in, in, in exigent circumstances. And what an exigent circumstances is basically an immediate threat, threat to life. It's that serious. 
uh, and you have to know that there's an immediate, immediate threat to life, uh, not the possibility or the chance uh, that there might be an immediate threat to life. Um, for example, if you see the individual on the private property and it is obvious to you that they are in significant medical distress, then that would be considered uh, an exigent circumstances where you could use medical equipment to, in the wilderness or for that matter, enter onto private property. Mechanized equipment can be used in the wilderness if uh, we need to re recover uh, human remains, a, a, a deceased individual, or if uh, the use of the equipment mitigates the, the, use to, the risk to rescue personnel. And this is oftentimes the case where you have an individual that is uh, injured, cannot, and needs extraction, but is far enough back that it will be difficult for rescue personnel to extract them without the use of mechanized equipment. Uh, if you use mechanized equipment in either uh, alternative two or three, you need to notify your command first and get a, approval approval to, to do so. Types of liability. Um, liability is your exposure, legal exposure for activities that you in, engage in. Uh, direct liability is the liability that you as an individual may face for uh, the activity that you as an individual engage in. You are directly liable for your own activities. Vicarious liability is liability that you take on for the actions of somebody that you are responsible for. So in a situation where I'm the incident commander and I play, per, place personnel in the field and thou, those personnel engage in some kind of activity that results in legal exposure. I, as the individual that was legally responsible for placing them in the field and for managing their activities, am vicariously responsible for their legal exposure. They may be directly liable for it. I may be vicari vicariously liable for it. Uh, your sheriff, the sheriff as the search and rescue, uh, the manager as the individual responsible for all search and rescue activities in your county is always going to be vicariously liable for the actions of uh, the search and rescue members in, act, acting either on searches or rescues in his county or in another county under his or her uh, authorization. Okay, Oregon Revised Statute 404, sub 200, definitions. Uh, a qualified search and rescue volunteer, somebody who's registered with the Sheriff's Office or OEM uh, to conduct SAR activities or is a member of a SAR unit designated or res registered with a Sheriff to engage in search and rescue activities. Most of us are not gonna be individually registered with the Sheriff's Office but we're gonna be members of our designated county search and rescue uh, organizations who are registered, and the organization is registered with the sheriff's office. <clears throat> a search and rescue volunteer may be someone that is uh, acknowledged in writing as a volunteer by Oregon Emergency Management, the sheriff, or the agent or designee of the sheriff at the scene of a rescue. Not necessarily an actual member of a search and rescue organization, but perhaps somebody that is a bystander or a member of another agency that is helping in a particular search, and, search or rescue incident. Uh, the, uh, Qualified search and rescue volunteer does not have to actually, does not have to be a, a state certified uh, volunteer. You do not have to complete your, uh, intern your OSSA test and training and uh, demonstrate your, your, your compliance with core curriculum in order to be a qualified search and rescue volunteer as long as you're still a member 
of your search and rescue organization. Search and rescue activities, um, searching, rescuing, or recovering individuals who are in need of being searched for, rescued, or recovered, uh, and the training that you may engage in that, uh, that allows you to be able to engage in search, rescue, and recovery activities. This is very Im important. Um, as search and rescue volunteers, as, we talk, as I talked about, you have a, a, a du duty to act. Um, you are required to, to engage in the activities to the extent that you are, are trained and that it is reasonable for you to engage in those activities. If you do, if you uh, follow the duty of care, if you uh, re respond within the, uh, the scope of your training and exercise appropriate duty of care then, uh, and do not engage in negligence, then you are, you are covered by liability insurance protection through the county. Um, and the county will defend, save harmless, and indemnify the volunteer. And what that means is, is that the county will pay the lawyer to defend you uh, and uh, pay any judgments or any costs that may be incurred as a result of a lawsuit uh, involving your, your activities as a search and rescue member. That's very important. It basically is uh, it's our insurance policy. Uh, and it's so we don't risk our, our own financial and personal well-being when we're engaged in search and rescue activities. However, you do not have coverage under the county's insurance policy if you engage in willful neglect of duty or you act in uh, a neg negligent manner. Um, and by willful, mi willful misconduct, basically, if you, uh, if you engage in an act that clearly is unreasonable and uh, would be known to be un uh, unlawful or Ill illegal to anybody I engaged in that activity. Uh, and negligence, again, failure to act as a reasonably prudent person would uh, within the, the scope of your training and the facts as you understand them to be at that point in time. Doesn't mean that you don't have, in, that, you, that you might not have insurance coverage. It just means that it may be uh, a, a, an issue to be addressed. So, can't be understated. If you're a qualified SAR volunteer who acts reasonably in good faith and within your scope of practice, it is within the scope of your training, while performing SAR activities under the direction of a sheriff in Oregon, you will receive significant state and federal liability protection. And they don't mean directly under the direction of the sheriff, but as, as long as you're a member of a search and rescue agency that is, that is approved by your sheriff. Don't violate somebody's federally protected rights. Our protections uh, under the state statutes go well beyond Good Samaritan law. Uh, the Good Samaritan law only applies to medical care provided voluntarily. We are not, uh, we, when we're, we are obligated to uh, perform as SAR personnel under our duty to act and aren't really volunteers for or engaged in voluntary activity for the purposes of the Good, Good Samaritan law. And that's okay because we have uh, insurance coverage through the county. Workers' compensation, this is uh, comp insurance on us. Should we be injured uh, or, or killed during a search and rescue uh, re re response? Um, in Malawi County, this is why we are very careful about tracking all of our training hours, our response hours. That's why it's very important that when you go on a search or go out on a call uh, for response that you make sure that you log in and you log out or you have the IC log you in or log you out 
So you're on the books as having responded in an official SAR activity in the event that you get injured while, while responding. We are well protected under Oregon revised statutes for our search and rescue activities, both in terms of liability to third parties and workers' compensation coverage for our, our own personal well-being. Search and Rescue Coordinator currently is Scott Lucas. He's at the Office of Oregon Emergency Management. He coordinates activities uh, between the state and federal agencies and our, our local search and rescue or organizations. Um, he will process requests for emergency equipment and personnel that go beyond your own agencies or adjacent agencies, uh, resource capabilities. Uh, Scott also helps us get uh, education and training programs that, that we need and gather statistics on search and rescue calls throughout the state over the course of the year and then generates reports to identify uh, uh, additional needs and resources that uh, we may need in order to respond safely and successfully. OEM, the state, uh, is engaged in the management of air aircraft searches. Uh, for the most part, they will, uh, your incident commander or your sheriff will co coordinate through OEM <coughs> if there's a need for either uh, aircraft for searches or aircraft for uh, either uh, subject extraction or uh, SAR personnel um, transport I into a search or rescue area or extraction from that area. As I mentioned, the sheriff or his designated representative is responsible for SAR in his, his or her county. Um, and that's why our authority flow, throws through the sheriff. It doesn't mean that we have the sheriff's authority. It means that we are acting only within the scope of the authority that he grants us. <clears throat> and why our organization works so closely with the, the sheriff's office and needs his approval and authority to respond in our own county or to other counties. When you respond on a a request for mutual aid or you request a mutual aid in your county. Uh, typically the sheriff of the county where the incident occurred is will be respond will assume responsibility for the multi-agency action or will uh, a, will adopt a unified command structure for management of a multi-agency uh, SAR operation. In terms of closing an area or restricting access to a search or, or an area where a rescue is taking place, the, sh the sheriff or his representative is the individual that has the authority to, to do that. Um, SAR personnel should not do that on their, on their own, own initiative, uh, but should request the sheriff or a deputy respond and uh, request permission to re restrict access. Sometimes that's going to be necessary if you're on the rescue or responses on the roadway and you need to limit or eliminate uh, other vehicular access. Sometimes it's just to uh, avoid a lot of personnel, a lot of um, uh, citizens who don't necessarily need to be there uh, in, in a, a, a rescue or a recovery situation, especially. It, if it has not been ruled out that it's a, a crime scene. Um, let your sheriff deal with the, the media, either directly or by appointing uh, a public information officer. Uh, SAR members in the field should avoid discussing their, their, uh, their field activities with the media or for that matter with somebody that is not in, engaged in, in the SAR response directly. And if an area is going to be restricted, uh, it has to be for a re reasonable amount of, of time. Search and rescue operating under the sheriff, meaning with the sheriff's, the, the sheriff's authorization can restrict a search area and not be sued. 
for violating a federally protected right, and that is uh, that's as long as you've your, your sheriff has, has made that call, and you, you're reasonable and have not done it for an unreasonable period of time. Each county uh, sheriff adopts a search and rescue plan, an annual search and rescue plan, that sets out policies and procedures, equipment personnel that are currently available with the organization, uh, how they contact their SAR members, and minimum training standards uh, for individuals, uh, especially if you have SAR members that have specialty training. Uh, ropes rescue technicians, swift water rescue technicians or operations, uh, folks with uh, alpine mountain uh, rescue, training and so forth that may be trained in certain disciplines to a higher level than the rank and file field responders. Uh, these plans are then gathered by the, the state and made available to other counties and um, it helps us in, in identifying another county that may have either personnel, training or equipment that we could use in a response that we don't otherwise have access to. After a SAR incident, it's important that uh, that the uh, the sheriff conduct a critique of the incident if uh, it's the mission's been something other than routine, um, uh, something perhaps that something either went wrong or went especially right or there was a use of a new resource or a new piece of equipment or a new agency, um, then uh, the sheriff will conduct a, a critique of the incident, basically a de debrief. We try and have them uh, on virtually any call where we have more than a couple of hours of, of response, anything other than the most routine responses. Um, and that's an opportunity to identify what, what worked, what didn't work, what we could do better next time. The state will be called for an ORS incident number. That's a state number assigned to every search and rescue incident uh, that typically your incident commander or your assistant incident commander will call the state at any time, get, get that number, uh, append it to all of the documentation for that search. Um, the same number will be used by other counties if you have a m mutual aid situation to where uh, other counties are coming into your county, other agencies, they'll use that same incident number. And it's also the number that will be used uh, if uh, on any workers' compensation paperwork in terms of that's, if someone's injured and needs work and workers' compensation coverage, that's the number and the incident paperwork that uh, will be used to evaluate the appropriateness of coverage. ORS 404-270 allows for reimbursement for search and rescue activities. Um, that is that uh, the sheriff could uh, co attempt to collect up to $500 from the subject of a search and rescue search or uh, a rescue. Um, for as long as it's in a backcountry and as long as the individual that's the subject of the search did not exercise reasonable care or violated laws. And typically in reasonable care would be somebody that uh, was appropriately clothed, had appropriate equipment, notified somebody of where they were going, when they would be back, um, uh, and um, it, anybody that didn't engage in that kind of appropriate, uh, reasonable care could be subject to being, to being billed uh, for uh, a, a response. I know my agency do, doesn't do this, quite frankly, because we don't want it becoming an issue as to whether folks will call for search and rescue if they, if they need help. Uh, we don't want them to avoid doing so for fear that they'll be that they, that they will they will be built, built uh, for for that for that cost. Uh, I don't know 
whether any of the other member counties do, do or not. But it is it's it's a an option that's that is available by statute. So, uh, in sum, uh, the you as a search and rescue member, you have a, a duty to. Uh, a, a duty to respond, a duty to provide care. Don't, that doesn't mean that you are expected to respond to every search or every call. We all have lives. It just means that if you do respond and you do go in the field, uh, that you have a, a duty to provide uh, treatment or assistance to the level of, of your training and as is reasonable in the, the scope of the situation and the, the, the scope of, of your personal training. You've got liability insurance through the county, you have workers' compensation insurance through the county, and as long as you follow those simple rules, and uh, you, you shall be fine.